Let's go over a class of medications known as the biguanides. Its origin dates back centuries ago to a plant called Galego officinalis. Despite its medicinal properties, it is classified as an invasive species in various parts of the country. Chemists discovered that this plant has elevated quantity of guadino containing compounds, which was later found to help lower blood sugars. When providers hear by guanides, most assume that there is only one member of this class. There are in fact several. They are fenformin, buformin, metformin. By guanides really means two guadino groups. Here is your first guadino, followed by your second. The names are actually derived from the chemical structures, with fenformins, phenyl group, with the buformins, butyl group, with metformins, two methyl groups. Another name for metformin is 1,1-dimethyl biguanide. In 1957, Unger, Freeman, and Shapiro published their works on the potential therapeutic effects on fenformin. A similar study was done on buformin in 1958, however, it was never brought to market in the U.S. By 1977, over 385,000 patients were taking fenformin. Unfortunately, it's also responsible for more than a thousand deaths per year due to a fatal side effect called lactic acidosis. It was officially withdrawn from the market on November 15, 1978. The rate of lactic acidosis is 10 to 20 times more frequent than metformin. Though the incidence is much lower, there was a more cautious approach to metformin. A consensus was made to set an absolute contraindication with a serum creatinine of 1.4 for females and a 1.5 for males. This is despite clinical trials showing the patients are able to clear a drug at much higher levels. Metformin went on to being approved in 1994, then went on to being marketed in 1995. Like main mechanisms include limiting the amount of glucose absorbed in the diet, hence the reason why you take it with food, limiting the amount of glucose your liver produces, and increasing the insulin sensitivity in the peripheral tissues. There are additional benefits in terms of reducing serum LDL and increasing fatty acid oxidation, but with minimal risk to hypoglycemia or weight gain. In fact, it has actually led to a slight weight loss by causing a drug-induced anorexia. They have also used metformin in particular as an adjunctive treatment in polycystic ovarian syndrome. However, this video will not provide an in-depth discussion of this off-label use. Since metformin is the only commercially available drug in the U.S., let's take a closer look at its mechanisms. When metformin is ingested, it travels to the small intestine where it gets absorbed. Approximately 10% of the drug is excreted unchanged in the feces. The approximate bioavailability is 50-60%, to with 90% of the absorbed dose being excreted unchanged in the urine by filtration or active tubular secretion. Metformin accumulates in the small intestines, salivary glands, and kidneys, which may explain the metallic taste reported by some patients. The concentration in the intestine is 10 times that of the plasma. It does not appear to bind any serum proteins and appears to distribute fairly rapidly in peripheral tissues. Lining the lumen side of the intestines, there are sodium glucose symporters, SGLT1, and the glucose uniporter, GLUT2, on the blood side. Metformin appears to activate AMP kinase, which in turn modulate SGLT1 and GLUT2, thereby affecting the amount of glucose absorbed. The exact mechanism is still unclear today. The most common side effects of taking metformin are GI-related, with the highest being diarrhea. The mechanism is still unclear, however, it is proposed that intestinal secretion of serotonin, changes in incretin or glucose metabolism, and or bile salt malabsorption may be to blame. Looking at the effects of metformin on gluconeogenesis, Metformin is transported into the hepatocyte via organic cation transport, OCT1, where it activates AMP kinase. Activation of AMP kinase results in the blocking the expression of PEPCK and glucose 6-phosphatase, thereby suppressing gluconeogenesis. As far as metformin affecting insulin sensitivity, it has been proposed that metformin enters the target cells to activate AMP kinase. AMP kinase will enhance the insulin receptors, which will thereby cause GLUT4-containing vesicles to migrate to the surface of the cell. Another possible pathway is AMP kinase functioning as an inhibitor to inhibitory pathway which will also lead to the same effect. Let's take a look at how metformin affects LDL and fatty acid oxidation. If you recall the mevalonate pathway as discussed in a separate video, statins act as a competitive inhibitor to the HMG-CoA reductase. If you also recall, this enzyme is highly regulated by AMP kinase. Metformin stimulates AMP kinase thereby inactivating this rate limiting step. This leads to a decrease in cholesterol and decrease in coenzyme Q10. Fatty acids normally go through beta oxidation in the mitochondria with the help of CPT1. Malonyl-CoA acts as an inhibitor to CPT1. Metformin stimulates AMP kinase, which in turn deactivates acetyl-CoA carboxylase, thereby limiting the conversion of acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA. The net effect is increased beta oxidation. Metformin is available in immediate and extended release formulations. The maximum dose for immediate release is 2550 per day. The extended release formulation differ in the technology used to deliver the drug. For glucophage and glumensa, the maximum dose is 2,000 mg per day, and Fortimate is 2,500 mg per day. The approximate A1C reduction is 1 to 2%. 
Because of the GI side effects, you want to start with a low dose and titrate weekly or biweekly as tolerated. For side effects, again, the most common are GI related. Metformin is pregnancy category B and it does enter breast milk. Therefore, insulin is still the drug of choice in pregnancy. Now, lactic acidosis is a life-threatening concern for patients taking biguanides. Hence, this is associated with worsening renal function. It can best be described as a production of lactate that exceeds its utilization. Patients usually present with a serum lactate of greater than 5 millimoles per liter, a pH of less than 7.35, along with an elevated anion gap. So let's return our attention back to gluconeogenesis, except this time in the absence of oxygen. As we mentioned earlier, pyruvate is normally generated with the help of the enzyme PEPCK. However, patients on metformin has a decreased expression of this enzyme. Pyruvate accumulates. In the absence of oxygen, pyruvate is reduced to lactate by lactate dehydrogenase. If you recall also, one mole of glucose yields four moles of ATP. ATP is broken down to ADP plus a hydrogen ion. It is the increase in hydrogen ions that drives down the pH. Hypoxia and hyperperfusion leads to a decreased uptake of lactate by the liver. Thus, the liver becomes a lactate-producing organ. Patient may present with various signs and symptoms, including increased heart rate, altered mental status, hyperventilation, or dyspnea. Another potential concern is megaloblastic anemia. The most common cause is vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiencies. Vitamin B12 is necessary for DNA synthesis. If deficient, it can lead to mental and neurological problems. Metformin impairs absorption of vitamin B12. Some lab tests considered include, but not limited to, CBC, peripheral smear, serum cobalamin, Schilling's test, LDH, and indirect bilirubin levels. This brings to our next topic on monitoring. Obviously, monitoring for renal function is critical, especially in our geriatric population. It's important to maintain adequate hydration at all times. Impaired hepatic function can increase the risk of lactic acidosis and should be avoided if possible. Metformin should be held 40 hours before and after any significant surgery and or procedure involving contrast. Alcohol consumption can potentiate the effect of lactic metabolism. Monitoring for vitamin B12 is not routine or necessary, but should be considered based on the patient's history and presentation and if there is concerning neurological signs and symptoms. Despite that the low risk of hypoglycemia, monitoring of blood sugars and A1C should be considered at regular follow-ups. Hypoglycemia may still occur in cases where the patient is fasting or is on a low-calorie diet. As a final note, metformin is widely prescribed today as first or second line agent in patients with type 2 diabetes. Even with all the technology available today, we are just beginning to unravel the many benefits as well as the complexity this class has to offer.